Patrice K. Armstead, and I'm the co-organizer for this event. Um, before we move forward with the program, I wanted to explain why my co-organizer, uh, Richard Peacott, and I decided to do this event, and also explain why we chose the individuals on the panel. A couple of months ago, Arisha and I were having a conversation about women in the movement and how great it would be to have a program honoring those women and tying that into the life and work of Ms. Harriet Tubman. Being as though March 10, 2013 will mark the 100th year of Harriet Tubman's transition, we thought of the idea of having an intergenerational dialogue between the new and old school activists. The ideas for this program weren't discussed all in one conversation. It came in bits and pieces. So this event today is kind of like, I think of it as like a puzzle. Um, the most difficult part of this program for both of us was deciding who would be the panelists. Um, there are a lot of women in Philadelphia that deserve to be on a panel, but of course we couldn't have all those people. Um, the old school activists on the panel were chosen because of what they contribute to the movement, um, to the struggle of African Americans, and more importantly, they are currently still active in the movement. The new school activists were chosen because of their involvement in their communities and the work that they've done thus far in the movement. Ms. Tubman, a, a woman who was an activist, an organizer, and an abolitionist, she was courageous, strong, fearless, and a true warrior. All the women on the panel, um, they possess those characteristics. Each old school, moving on into the program, Marisha Peacock will introduce the new school activists and they will discuss their work and relate to the old school activist work. Each old school activist will take a couple of minutes to talk about how their work extends Harriet Tubman's legacy as a freedom fighter. And after they speak, we will have our intergenerational uh, conversation. Sister Sakari, Sister Sakari has worked around issues concerning um, the lack of minority participation in the labor movement in Philadelphia. And for over 20 years, she has been feeding and clothing the homeless in the city. She is a founder of the organization African Daughters of Fine Lineage. And when I think about the work um, that I'm doing in the community and how it relates to Sister Sakari, the first thing I think about is poverty and unemployment. Sister Sakari, um, the work that she's doing in the community, I mean, it wouldn't, she wouldn't have to do it if poverty wasn't an issue and if unemployment wasn't an issue. She's went to different uh, work sites where there's no mi minority participation. And she protested on those sites. There's a percentage of people within the homeless population that are homeless due to unemployment or underemployment. The only solution to these issues is increasing employment opportunities within our communities with livable wages like union jobs and other jobs with livable wage and decent benefits. Assistant Safari mentioned in a few conversations we had about how each one of us have an ancestral assignment. And she says her ancestral assignment is to demand justice for black and poor people. And when I think about what my ancestral assignment is, it's similar to Sister Sakari's, but mine is you know, more to make noise about poverty in our community and also continue to do the work that fights poverty. So when I relate what I'm doing in Sister Sakari, um, the two, two issues is just poverty and unemployment. We are both working around those issues. Now, the level of work that I'm doing is nowhere near the level of work of Sister Sakari. But, you know, in time, you know, hopefully I'll get there. Right now I'm not there but hopefully I will get there. Um, I would like to introduce Sister Sakari, and she's gonna talk about herself and the work that she's been doing um, for over 30 years in the city of Philadelphia. Good evening. I am so excited to be in the presence of all you young folks it does my heart good to see all of you young, black, white, and everybody here because they're conscious, because everyone in this room does have an assignment. You came from somebody and somewhere, and you sit and stand on the shoulders of those folks who you know, made it possible for you to be sitting in this room. 
I am a, I refer to myself as a transplanted African because of my ancestors who came and suffered and died and struggled in the Middle Passage, who were stolen and beaten and taken from their mother's breast milk, brought here to the shores of America, and somehow or another, because of their strength and their desire to make it in spite of being treated with all the greatest inhumanity, here I sit. I have an ancestral obligation and responsibility to my ancestors to make sure that I demand justice for the ones who died and suffered in that middle passage. I have a middle passage. I came from a southern state, Wilmington, North Carolina. A lot of you may know about the Wilmington 10, Dr. Ben Chavis. I was a young student advocate, uh, advocate in, in, in this little small town, it's much larger now. We were um, mistreated. We, you know, I used to have to go to school. They would throw snakes on me. They would spit in my face. I had to arm myself every day to fight just to go to school. They closed down a black school and they pushed us into what they call integration, which I believe has been the worst thing that could ever happen to black people. But I was thrust along with other black people into this all white world. Because where I came from, the only time I saw white folks, if they were the insurance man or the rent man, they didn't come into our neighborhoods. Or, you know, unless you were doing day's work and they let your mama or your grandmother off at the curb. And that was fine with us. We had all of the resources that you would need. We had great financial institutions. We, we were able to spend our money among ourselves. We went everywhere, you know, we just didn't have to contend with them. Unless, of course, we had a street too, it was called Market Street. Once you cross Market Street, then you were in their land. But, you know, I remember my grandmother lived in the country. My mother lived in the city. So my grandmother used to keep me uh, up until I was about six. And I remember, and you know, she was 60 some years old, blind in one eye. And we would have to ride the Greyhound bus, my sister and I. And my grandmother would flag the bus down. And she would tell us, get behind my dress tail. And the bus would pull up. And the bus driver would open the door and say, nigga, are you going to get on? Now, my grandmother had, had purchased three seats. At that time, you would buy an adult seat and two half fare seats. All of these seats were at the front vacant. So we would have to go to the back of the bus. We had three shoe boxes. This is how black people traveled in the South, you know, during that time, because you were afraid to go in or you couldn't go in the white restaurants so you had a shoe box, one with chicken, one with cake, and you had some water in a mason jar. So you wouldn't have to get all these buses and, and you know, be in a, and you, even to go to the bathroom because it, they would attack you. Mm -hmm. So we would, you know, uh, we, we'd go to Richmond, Virginia. Sometimes we had to ride 500 miles holding, you know, so my grandmother could sit down. There were all these seats, the sailors were out front, but we were not allowed to sit there. I have never forgotten the indignity to my grandmother and to my mother, when my mother first, in, you know, in, in Wilmington, North Carolina, in North Carolina, it was only in the 60s before they were able to vote. I remember going with my mother to vote, and she would sign her name. They would have a big jar of butter beans and a big jar of sand. And what you would have to do is to guess how many butter beans and how much sand. Quite naturally, we could not do that. And I asked my mother, why do you continue to do this? you know, to let them treat you this way. She said, because I want it recorded that I was here, that I demanded justice, whether they gave it to me or not, that I would continue. And so all my life, I knew it was important mm -hmm. that I represent my mother, my grandmother, and all of these Africans that were mistreated and denied justice in America. The Wilmington 10, I want to let you know that you know, being an activist, we closed down all of the schools in Wilmington, North Carolina. We refused to accept what they did to us because we began to fight. And we frightened white folks in the town and they closed the school. So we began to open a school in a church. We went to a white minister. I had never been in a church with a white minister. A white minister in a black church, it was a Methodist church. He opened his doors to us. We opened up, we call our freedom school. We had school every day. The children would come in and they would go home. Now, I stayed at that church 
I would spend a the night there because the Klan would come through the street every night and, and, and uh, what do you call it, pick up trucks and shoot at us. And, and we and the, the, the church community would come over and defend the church. I remember I got some book shots in my arm. I would not go home because the church had become a haven of justice. And, and the, most of the people in the town, the black folks, were scared of white folks. They would not help us. So eventually, we had to go to the United Church of Christ, and we sought out the Reverend Ben Chavis. He was only 20, 23 years old. He came in to help us. In the process of that, we had a um, young man. Every night, my job was to go through, you know, the church had what was called a moat. And then it had a parish house. Because I'd go to the church every night to make sure everybody had gone. We'd get them out before it became dark because we didn't want them to be in, the, you know, at risk because the clan would come through there every night. And I'd go through the church to make sure everybody had gone. This one particular night, there was a store from here to right there. Well, right there, this is the church. The, during the 70s, in the late 70s, the 60s, the um, white folks began to get paid with what, what they call uh, riot insurance. They would burn their properties and the value of it would increase because they would say that black people had burned them out. So this particular Jewish merchant, he had somebody to burn his store. He bur they burned his store and they had a woman, she was like 83 years old. We had a young man, Stephen, he jumped over the moat after I told him not to leave. He went around to help this old lady pull out her furniture and the police shot him and killed him. They took him and threw him up on his grandmother's porch and said, is this your nigga? And I'm saying this and all these things have fallen inside of me to say that here you are again, you must, you must demand justice for the ones that have come from the middle passage. All of you have a middle passage. That was my middle passage. I stayed in that church the next night the, the Klan came through shooting and shooting. The next morning, as black children, the children that were after watching cartoons on Saturday, go outside and play hopscotch. The children were playing on the street. We saw this pickup truck coming towards us, and we, I saw a 30 30, that's a gun with a scope on it, and he was coming towards us and shooting, and shooting on the street. He shot on the street. We were able to remove those children. And I stood there, and I prayed to my ancestors. And when I opened my eyes, you know, you know what I saw? He was in the truck with his son. He, he lost his life. I don't know how, but the ancestors came and took care of him because he was coming to murder us mm. because we were only there demanding justice. Yeah. We had not murdered anybody. We had not lynched anybody. We had not raped anybody. This is my youth. I remember as a child, I used to go down to the plum bushes and watch the clan burn crosses and plot to come out and rape and murder and do stuff to us in the black community. What could we do? The police department was in the loop. But again, because of my middle passes and because I knew what I had to do, I didn't ever let go of that. And then what did they do? They went ahead and accused, and I don't know to this day why they, um, they, didn't, um, they didn't indict me. They did indict me and some, they, they sent out some indictments and said if we were ever on the school grounds, then they would lock us up. I came home one day, I'm a southerner. So, you know, in the south, you used to have chicken on Sunday, darling. I came home one day, I had a little job, and I smelled chicken and chocolate cake. It was on a Wednesday. I asked my mother, I said, what's going on? And she had this big trunk, and she had it, you know, laying out before she had packed my clothes. She said, honey, you gotta go. They had called my house and said, that they were gonna burn my mother's house down, kill me, take my father's job. I was on my way to New York. Crying, didn't wanna leave my mother, but the white folks was gonna kill me. Why? Because I demanded justice and I knew what my middle passage was. So, you know, I'm talking a little longer. Again, <laughs> I just wanna say that because I want y'all to find out about the Wilmington team because it's in your time now. I want you to know and in doing so and with these young people because that those kind of things are still going on. You have a mirror in jail. You have the, the, the Ben Chambers and those 10 people, they had almost 300 years, but finally they were, they were pardoned by Governor Purdue about three or four weeks ago. And, and I did time with them. I wasn't in jail, but I did time. So just remember, young people, 
We have an ancestral obligation. You should not see homeless people hungry. You should not see people working on job sites where there's nobody of color. You're supposed to raise hell. You're supposed to raise your voice. You're not supposed to let people do things like the police kill and murder your, your citizens. Right. Right. You're supposed to speak up That's because right. you have an ancestral obligation. That's Sarisha Pekai is next. Peace, everybody. Thank you all for coming out tonight to honor such amazing women who are doing work in the legacy of Harriet Tubman. My name is Arisha Picot, and I'm a grassroots organizer and a prison abolitionist here in Philly. Um, it's an honor tonight because I get to introduce someone I greatly admire, another prison abolitionist, Teresa Schultz. Coalition, which is an organization that was founded and started by her father, political prisoner Russell Maroon Schultz. incarcerated. Um, Teresa, of course, our father incarcerated for political reasons. My father not, but his mere presence in prison politicized me and really opened my eyes up of how corrupt this criminal justice system and prison system really is. Um, while at Human Rights Coalition, I got to watch Teresa and um, we worked in very interesting conditions. Uh, we, Human Rights Coalition is on the third floor of the lava. So when it was hot, we didn't have an AC. I'm not even sure we had a fan. And when it was cold, there was no heater. So and to just give a little background, Human Rights Coalition work is really heavy. Um, they get hundreds of letters a week of people incarcerated um, detailing some type of violation against them, whether it's verbal, uh, physical abuse, whether it's a guard spending their food, whether it's someone retaliating with meal tampering for um, reporting the guard who's spending their food. So it's really heavy work. And one thing I noticed about Teresa was that as she would respond to these letters, it wasn't just a quick, you know, here's how you file a grievance, um, here's the information to report in abuse logs. She really spent her time responding to these brothers and sisters who nobody else um, had um, reached out to. Um, she let these brothers and sisters know that she understood their struggle and that she cared. And I just want to say a little thing. Um, at HRC, we used to call prisons to put pressure on prisons. And me, I couldn't get past like the mail room. But Teresa, for some reason, she could finagle her way up to the superintendent, the warden. I'm not quite sure how she did it, but she did it. That's commitment. And I just want to, before I bring Teresa up, and say that I love Teresa because not only does Teresa work and fight for the bigger names, like the political prisoners, like her father, but she also struggles and fights for the people that nobody else knows. She, she's very dedicated to the everyday person in prison who does not have support. And to me, that's what a true prison abolitionist is. Their fight is to bring the whole prison system down. So please welcome me and welcome in Teresa Schultz. so honored this evening to be here. It's nowhere else I would rather be right now. And um, this 
sister just took me back. Um, we are people, black people have really suffered. And some of us are really sick mentally because after slavery, we were just forced out there and just, excuse me. So just to fend um, for you, now see. <laughs> to bear with me because one of the other things, Arisha introduced me very well, but I um, kind of noticed my neighborhood. I'm in West Philly running amok and um, I happened to be walking one day and I heard a senior citizen say, I'm so scared of these teenagers. And that hit me like a ton of bricks because when I was coming, uh, I was afraid of the senior citizen. We were afraid of citizens in our area. You know, you couldn't even spit on the sidewalk the wrong way. You could slap inside your head, and it could be anyone outside of your family that could get you in order. So to hear, just to hear a senior say, "I'm so afraid of these kids," I knew, I knew there had I, that I had to take a stand. And what I did was open my home to foster kids. So this month, February, March, February was my first year, uh, and I've taken in eight children. That's my little time. Father that helped. 
his people, the father who stood on the front lines to protect his community, a father who at 10 years of age wouldn't um, patronize a corner store. Um, there was two corner stores. One was owned by a black man, one was owned by a Jewish guy. Of course, the Jewish guy got the better deals and uh, from the uh, 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 middleman who would come and stock the store, and the black man was charged more money. And my dad, at 10 years old, started a protest. He didn't want you to go to this store to buy ice cream cone. You had to go to the black, the brother's store. And the kids were protesting like, no, he's cheaper than the, than the black man. And my father was staying guard in front of that black owner's store. So you got to deal with me because you want to deal with the black guy in the community and not this one. And I want to teach you why and what the difference is and why his products are more expensive. And this brings me back to, and the sister was just saying, when I was coming up, and in my community, I didn't see many whites either, and I've been in West Philly over 40 years. Everything in my community was owned by blacks. I mean, you had black women that do your hair, you had black educators, you had black um, owners of the stores in our neighborhood, everything. I hadn't seen an Asian or a Latino person owning anything in my community. So I come from a strong background of seeing this stuff uh, um, throughout my growth. When I went to school in the 70s, I was in the sixth grade in 76. I had all black teachers and I had a black principal. And when that principal ran amok, the parents yes, was right. on his ass. Yes, right. And he did what the parents said to do. If there was a wrong to be right, the principal was going to write it after the parents got on him because the principal is like the director of an orchestra. And when there's something out of order in that orchestra, the director can bring it back together. But he won't bring it back together unless he's forced to. And we had a community then that forced. And if they did do it right, I can remember the schools went on strike. The community came together and they had their own schools. We started educating, they were educating us. And there was no need to heavily depend on the public school system. Here's a system that enslaved black folks. And I can't hardly credit them for trying to educate blacks. Um, it's a sub, it's, it's beneath what our kids are really supposed to be getting. Mm -hmm. So in this day and age, when something happens to you, I don't care if it's in the public school, it's with the jobs, it's with people being poor, you must take a stand. You have to take a stand and let these people know you will not tolerate anything because the more we tolerate, the more they give us. Now when you look at what happened at Occupy, we had a lot of, lot of younger, I seen so many young white students who would leave school. And I would talk to someone, they said, oh, I gotta get back and take a, an exam. And then they would be back hours later. I spent a lot of time at Occupy. And it hit me that here's a time now that blacks, uh, uh, whites, are being knocked around financially um, as far as the education went. I mean, not to say, we have had a struggle, black folks, not uh, no struggle like what we have been through. Unfortunately, here's a generation of white young kids that have always had, had what they needed. They had homes. They were always told they would go to college and get a proper education. And here's a time now where it's hitting hard where the people at the top are so greedy right now, so vicious right now, that even young white folks and uh, young and white America don't have what they had always expected. No longer is there middle class. No longer is there respect for the common man. I don't care if you're black or you're white. Right now, we live in a system that don't give a damn about women, children, no one. They don't care what color you are. 
They don't care if you get medical. They don't care if you have a job. But yet, it seems like they just want this to go on. At some point, we're going to have to take a stand and let them know this cannot continue to happen. Now, whether this be you, don't go to work for a week. And don't be scared to do, when people present these kind of things to you, don't be scared to take a stand. They're waiting for you to take that stand, because then that's going to boggle their mind, because they're so used to getting away with what they get away. If you were to take a stand, it's going to confuse them and you will win. So with that, you can win. And we will win, and we will free people like my father and all political prisoners. I have an obligation to help women who are in their 70s visit the prison. There's one time, two years straight in a row, I took a family member to 16 passenger vans. I would drive seven hours to SCI Green, seven hours back. But I got people there that hadn't seen their loved ones in 16 years or more. I got ladies in their ages that haven't seen their kids. And that's the kind of stand you have to take. Take a stand. Don't be scared of the youth in your community. Take a stand when it comes to cutbacks, when it comes to medical. Take a stand whatever way you can. The don't be like me and maybe take eight kids in them one year. <laughs> take a stand. There are all kind of ways you can take a stand, and these women will show you the kind of stand that we can take. Thank you, Teresa. Next up, we will have Natasha Butler introducing Dr. Regina Jennings. Ethan, everybody, can y'all hear me good? Yeah. yeah. Um, I was really, um, I'm honored to be here tonight, and I want to thank Arisha and Patrice. I think y'all put on a very amazing event. <laughs> over there, and especially our young sisters. I'm real honored to see them because every time I've seen them in the community, it always um, empowers me to keep going. Um, this sister right here, Sister Sakura, she talked about the obligation, and, I, and that really struck me. I didn't write anything tonight. I didn't really come here. I didn't know what I was going to say, but she talked about an obligation. That's right. And that just, did my mic go up? That just rings with me, uh, this obligation, this obligation that I think all of us have. You know, not just us 10 people sitting on this stage, but all of us have an obligation. Now think about Harriet Tubman. You know, she was free, of, well, you know, she was free from, you know, being chained up and being a slave, but she went back because she felt like she had an obligation to go free, you know, other slaves. And I think about that, that was her obligation. And I think as organizers today, all of us in here, we're organizers. Just being here tonight, show that we want to be organized. We want to organize, you know, for a better community. We want to overturn this crooked, rotten system. We want to do things different. And that's our obligation. I'm, you know, I see mothers who come here, they brought their children. You know, I see babies crying it, and you know, it shows me that they have a real obligation. They want to really be here and to really, you know, organize people and to come out here and tell a story. So I just feel good. I feel inspired, and I just want to introduce Dr. Regina Jennings. She's a former member of the Black Panther Party. She Revolutionary Party, a black revolutionary party that, that consisted of women and men and children, and they fought for the economic rights of black people here in Philadelphia and, you know, pretty much around the United States, and they had recognition all around the world. And her academic work it includes 30 essays and two written books, Race, Rage, and Roses, Midnight Morning Muses, and her scholarly work includes Malcolm X and the Poetics of Haki Madhubi. Madhubuti, I'm sorry and poetry of the Black Panther Party, memory, morphogenetic fields, hip hop. Dr. Jennings is an activist, a revolutionary freedom fighter, mother, widow, and a professor. She has made a tremendous contribution to the struggle of liberation of African Americans. And here she goes right here. Yeah. Blessings, 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 
promise to you all, this is beautiful. You know, I've been, I've, I've been for the past, uh, I guess, three decades or so, it always used to bother me that, you know, the Panthers weren't honored, you know, that, um, uh, you know, who, who would hire a Bobby Seal? Um, Huey is dead, and I mean, it's like, you know, I really have wanted for a long time to, not, not really me, but to just have the memory of the Black Panther mm -hmm. Party honored, it should be taught in schools. Yes. You understand? Woo! What we did, you understand for real, for real, for real, what we did. And we did it for you. When this sister I talks sure, about an sure. ancestral memory, she is not jiving. Yes, we were Marxist, socialist, African centered, whatever you want to call us. But when I really think about what it is that we were doing, we were calling you forward. We were saying, okay, you, you government, you, I mean, it's children here. You know what we said, okay? You want to kill us? Well, you know, you're going to have to go through the Black Panther Party if you want to do some shooting. And we shot back. death wish, which some scholars have said, yeah, I didn't want to die, I'm so glad I'm here. <laughs> but all of us loved our people mm -hmm. so much. That's why you be said, we're willing to die for the people. Mm -hmm. You understand? Okay. That's what Harriet Tubman said. Clearly, that's what Harriet Tubman said. And one of the things that I always will love about that sister is that, not that making policy is wrong, don't get me wrong, not that running for office is wrong, but Harriet took her body and went, as the sister said, Harriet had escaped to nominal freedom. She could have stayed and worked with the free black community and did whatever she needed to do. But her drive, her spirit, her, her Jesus, because she was Christian, and she would say, Jesus, what do you want me to do? When the posses were on her tail, when there was little babies just like this one getting ready to cry, first of all, Harriet knew the land. She knew what herbs to feed to that child so the child would sleep so everybody could run. And when she had to leave, when she had to leave that particular trail that she knew, she would say, Jesus, which way do I go? And quite frankly, Jesus must have told her which way to go because <laughs> sister never got caught. Do you understand that? Wow. That she never got caught? Ever? Mm. How did this one black woman do this? Mm. My sister was talking about take a stand. You got to take a stand. I want to tell you a story. I didn't know what I was going to talk about when I got up here. Anyway, mm -hmm. I do want to show you this. This is an actual photo in Africa of an enslaved man. Probably he tried to run. I have, I have several of these for you. I have a lot of gifts for you, so come up afterwards because I just made copies and you can take this with you. Because one of the things that I want to come out of this gathering, I don't want to just meet you all in this public setting with cameras and lights and all like that. <laughs> if we really want to fight, you fight above ground and below ground. You don't be announcing everything you're going to do. <laughs> hoping sincerely that there will be a cadre of you who are serious and not agent provocateurs. I know you here. If Pam Africa is here, I know you here. If Mona is here, I know they're here. Okay? But we need to meet. This is cool but it's even better in the dark. 
Now, I wanted to share this with you because I am in education. I've never told this story. I'm going to tell this story. I, uh, when I started my career, I supposedly won this uh, fellowship to go to Franklin and Marshall College in Pennsylvania where I didn't know I won, they were gonna pay my salary and I was still finishing off graduate school. I was in a lot of debt. So it was nice to win. They told me I had one out of 400 applicants, you know, all this. Well, I got to Franklin and Marshall, home of some of the most racist people I've ever met in life. And it's called Franklin and Marshall because it's named after Ben Franklin. It was started in 1797. And I was the only and the first black teacher they had ever hired. A school that started in the 18th century. And I'm the first black teacher that they hired. Well, it was mostly white students there, of course. I'd walk into class and I'd be the only black person in the class. I revolutionized those white students. <laughs> we, they started. They didn't want me to go home. They just wanted to read more and more and more African American literature. So I said, so I'm like teaching all day and then teaching all night. I said, no, that can't work. I said, we need to start black studies here. Mm -hmm. Now get right on her, who whoa. <laughs> me and my mostly white students and some black students started African American studies at Franklin and Marshall College. Now, as I wrap up, I want to say this to you. It drove me out of my mind. The racism was so thick. The battles were so many. I lost my mind, and I'm not talking metaphorically. We got calls from the Ku Klux Klan. My so-called colleagues hated my guts. They did all kinds of treacherous things to me. The only black teacher in the whole school. Since I was the only black teacher in the whole school, I'd walk across campus, people, hey, Professor Jeff, hey, hey. Of course they knew me. I was the only black teacher in the whole school. And I say this because we have a crisis even today. This country elected Barack Obama, but they want to tear apart African American studies. Understand that. Right here, if you're from Drexel, how's your African American studies department, or is it still a program? How is it doing? <laughs> if you're from Penn, oh, you are just starting to hire people independently for African American studies. You dig? And if you're from Temple, Lord have mercy, Percy. <laughs> Look here. One of the facts tenets of Huey P. Newton and Bobby G. Seale's 10-point platform and program was black studies. African American studies belongs to you and yours, whether you go to a university or not. You must take a stand when it comes to making sure that your African American studies departments in this country are healthy and thriving. That is key, okay? And I wanted to share with you, I have, um, this was the Black Panther Party's book list when I was a teenager, hated reading, hated school. But when I joined the party, I started loving learning. And this was our book list. This will be a This sister right here, Kathleen Cleaver, another great woman, 
was my teacher when I was in the Black Panther Party. So I have this for y'all too. And I thought I would also bring this book of pictures so that you could really see what we looked like back then and what we stood for back then. But you know, people, this is now. Many of our brothers and sisters are either in exile or dead or dying or they're political prisoners. We know about Mumia, and I know my, my sister Pam is going to talk about Mumia, and Mumia must be free. And I also want to throw out another name, Eddie Conway. Yes. <laughs> Over 30 years in jail. Sundiata Akoli. 39 years in jail. Now let me tell you what it means when they lock up such brothers. It means that you don't get to see strong black men. That's the purpose. strong black women and other strong black men and other strong white men and other strong when you see certain types of men and women it is infectious this is why they would keep these good brothers including her father in jail now it's up to us to get them out Thank you all. Um, peace. Good evening. Thank you all for inviting me to participate in such a wonderful panel. Um, I'm truly humbled, and I wish I knew another word other than humble because I feel like we use that over and over again. But to really be sitting here and to take in everything that you've said, even some of you who I've worked with. Um, it's an amazing feeling, like I get goosebumps, and even though my baby's crying, and I wanna run off the stage, and her daddy's got it, so um, we're gonna proceed with the program. Um, but I'm a member of the uh, Sankofa Community Empowerment, and I'm also a member of the Askia Coalition Against Police Brutality, yeah. and I've been organizing. <laughs> Philadelphia since I got here um, in 2004, and one of the first sisters I met was Sister Basima. I joined the UNIA, that was the first organization I joined. Um, I went to a town hall meeting, there was a call to action, you want to do something? Organize, join an the organization. They announced the you know Sunday mass meetings, I went to the first, that, 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 I think that was like a Thursday, that next Sunday I went to a mass meeting, and I joined the UNIA. Um, and it was beautiful seeing people do the work. I'm coming from Boston, Massachusetts, enough said, right? <laughs> so it was amazing to be in Philadelphia and to see people doing the work and to see sisters doing the work. And most of the women in the UNIA were older, but Sister Basima, she looked out. You know, it was the first person that I was able to connect with who, um, who welcomed me, who put me to work, which I loved. I was like, okay, I'll take an assignment. And I saw my reflection in her in that she got the work done, all right? Anyone who knows Sister Basima knows she gets the work done. She doesn't need a whole lot of directives. If she sees a need, she will fill that space and she gets the work done. I was reading her bio and I'm like, oh, this is so humble. I was like, people don't even know all the work she's done. She didn't even mention the fact that she started a school. All right, so she's been educating youth before I was even born. She had her own institution. Things that we talk about doing, she's actually done before, right? She's managed to build a family, have a husband, children, and grandchildren who she loves dearly and takes care of on a regular basis, which are feats within themselves, let alone organizing on a regular basis. And like I said, getting things done. This woman is doing all of those things. If you've ever attended any of the um, Marcus Gavi birthday celebration, Sister Basima is the woman behind that work. <laughs> She's the woman behind that work. And whenever, you know, it's like, I'm tired, I don't wanna go to this meeting, I'm not sure. How can you say that when we have sisters 
who've been doing this work a long time, who are, who are running the meetings, you know, who are hitting out of you all as well. I stand before you today to share some of the great work. I'm not one to stand still either, so do mind, don't mind me. <laughs> but my mother, when I'm speaking of myself, I will speak and reflect a lot of, or back and forth, speaking of my mother. My mother was one of the baddest black women that I've ever met in my life. And if you feel that way about your mother, give yourselves a good black hand. And if you're not black and you feel that way about your mother, give yourself a good hand. Because I don't think there's anything more powerful than the wound from which we come through. Ego gets in our way and some reason, I thought because I used to hang with all the brothers. I have seven brothers. I'm the last of 12 children, five girls, seven boys. And men has always been my friend. I love my sisters. I have a sisterhood, strong black sisterhood that can't be shaken. But men have always been my secure factors, my confidence. For some reason, that's just who I am. But my brothers, have been a vessel in my life to keep me on track. They have brought me back to centerfold. Sometimes ego get in the way, that's where I wanted to start at. Because each of us and our own selves are who we are, but we come from someone and we're connected to somebody. But Basima thought that, you know, I was doing my own thing. You know, I, hey, hey, I'm a revolutionary. Black power, let's do this. But at some point, you have to then reflect back the, where you come from. You start going back and checking who my people be. You start looking back and saying, what's my history about? 
Wow. What a history. Sakari, uh, she tells her story and just takes me there all the time. But my mother never talked about her past. That's the pain that Sister Sakari is humble enough to go within herself and bring out and still feel whole. There was a disconnection in the family very early on that my mother would never talk about. My grandmother died when my mother was five years old. My grandfather left and left her at the grave site with the family. She never seen him again until she was 16, 17 years old. But all the time in between that, it left me wondering, how could you just leave your child? What happened? Only to go and research more about who they were. History told the story, the in-depth story of slavery, how barbaric it was, how brutal it was, what great secrets that lie upon it. I knew as an early child, as an early, at an early age, as an early child, that Eartha Kitt was a blood relative of ours. I knew that she was Catwoman. We all would get at the television and watch her come out, cousin. She's, she's coming on. It was the show in the house. Everyone knew it. But as I got older to be a mother, I wanted to meet my cousin. I wanted to know why you were so separate from everyone else. Who are you? What is, what's going on with you? And I met her, and she still separated herself. But it didn't stop the love that I felt for her. I went on to research. I'm going to just go real fast forward. Two years ago, I had the first opportunity to visit my mother's home in Fort Mott, South Carolina. Before going there, I met up in New York with family members from my last dad, granddad's aunt, my, my great aunt, which was my granddad's uh, sister. Only to find out one of the great dark secrets of the family was Eartha Kitt was not my cousin. She was my aunt. She was one of the daughters that was left to the side. She was one of the lighter skinned of the daughters who was shunned away. And because, as we know, the psychological ramification that many of us go through today, when you're pushed away, there leaves something within you. Erfer and her other sister, my Aunt Celia, are the only two that ever talk about what happened during slavery. It is profound that every last one of you have an obligation to your future, to your presence, to know who you are, where your family at. I'm not talking about more fully, south fully, west fully. Get out of there. Because for the most part of us, all of us are from down south somewhere. You know, we come through the rivers and they dropped us off in Virginia and they shipped in the shores and we just went all around the world. But somewhere, you have to go deep. It's painful. And I'm still doing research. I didn't know what I was gonna talk about, but I'm just doing what the ancestors say to Tell the story. Because we all have our own story we all go in glory and we think that we're somebody above everybody else, but we are connected to such a deeper concern that many of us don't even want to touch. My mother dealt with people. I didn't know racism when I was coming up. I had no clue of it. My mother was a farm leader. She was always an organizer. She carried people from six in woods they got on a bus, she'd have her driver, the bus driver drive the people to do the work, pick the blueberries and any and everything else the farming was doing, and we came back home. My mother took care of white people, my mother took care of Hispanic people. We didn't know racism. My mother said if somebody's in trouble, then you help. But something happened in my life, because I had my own story, where racism slapped me in my face and made me recognize that there is something totally different so I am the conductor of my family. Harriet was one of the greatest conductors, women conductors that we talk about. Although there were many before her, like the great 
uh, uh, Queen Ty, the great Enzinga, uh, 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 yes. and, and so many names that we could call that was before Harriet. So as we go from the shores of Africa to the shores of Virginia, black women have always been the vessel, have always been the vessel of the universe. We were the breastfeeders. We were the men who want, want, wanters. I say like my brother, Dr. E. Shaka Musa Barris Shingle used to say, he said, you want to know where heaven is at? The children are occupied over there. <laughs> but he said, if you want to know where heaven is at, then you must understand that heaven is between the thighs of a black woman. It's nothing, nothing sexual and out of place with it. We're talking about the laws of nature. When you're talking about, young sister, I was talking to her earlier about doula classes. She said, well, what's a doula? And I'm sitting here and I'm saying, my gosh, you know, but then I had to say, you have to share. Because how is it that our children don't know who the doulas are? How is it that young black women don't know where the real midwives are at? How is it? where we fed everybody's babies, where we brought everybody's child into the world. When there was life being brought, it was the black woman sitting at the hymns, waiting for life to come into this world. So young sisters, I ask you today to please join us as the Black Cross nurses where I sit as the fourth assistant president general for the UNI. nurses. There should not be one young black woman or man, because they got them in the hospitals too if you're interested. I know many of brothers who brought their children into the world properly so. Nothing wrong with it. They make us look demonized. And Brother, you get out the room and it's his baby. He's been in the womb already. <laughs> he knows what's going on. And he had the first peep and what? My husband went off when I had the first child. I said, I don't want him in the room. You know, I mean, just, just the doctor. I wasn't used to having a man. My sisters always accompany us. My husband laid me out. He said, hey, wait a minute. This man don't even know you. We just met this man for the first time. So I had to rethink myself and rethink this brother's position in my life. I brought his baby in the world. And some other man has a right before him. Backwards thinking. So let's erase all of that. Let us begin to take charge of who we are. Let's begin to continuously raise up the conductors. We talked about the great work that these young sisters has brought before us. We talked about the great work of the sisters, the relatively older sisters. I don't want to say older women, but <laughs> we playing and we playing at toss. But just to sort of joke inside, it is sincerely important that the message that you're hearing this evening is just not about black women who have revolutionary minds. The only thing I'm short of tonight, and I think it was strategically done because the creator is my vessel, I was in my mind prepared to come with my shotgun tonight. <laughs> I wanted you all to understand that you have a right to bear arms. Right. But right. something said to me, don't get it, talk about it. Because I know some agents in the house, and they'll go back and say, you know, you and I are on the stage sling guns. We don't want that. We're raising up a nation. For the first time in over 70 years, the Black Cross nurses was in dormant. For the first time, I have been given an assignment to raise it back up. It has been a task. Because those women who showed us that I stand on, whoa. Whoa. So we ask you all this evening, don't just leave here tonight with the information and that we sound good, we speak good, we look good, we good mothers, grandmothers, great grandmothers, whatever. But this must go on. And so again, the table's over here, your signature is definitely needed. We're asking you all to join us and making sure that you carry the word out there that ain't no woman better than the black woman. And no disrespect to nobody, we are the original women of the planet Earth. It ain't what I'm saying scientifically, biblically, 
spiritually look at it, it's there, you can't do nothing with it, join it, step with it, or move out of our way. Oh. I thank you all. Shout out the brothers in the audience for being able to attend an event during this Women's History Month where we're giving homage and appreciation to women. But we gotta understand that it takes two forces together to really raise this mighty nation that we're trying to revitalize. So definitely shout out to the sisters, but I appreciate all the male presence right, being here. Right. Um, definitely to be spoken of is um, the children. So shout out to the children that we all, you know what I'm saying, work for. Um, it's the children in the corner right here. just so relative and I understand where everybody's going as far as like you know this thing being kind of unscripted because the ancestors really are in the room right now and they're working through us I mean as far as the young sisters I can speak on behalf of the energy I'm feeling right now we're all nervous and really in honor of being in your presence because we know that this time has been coming and all of our life we've been essentially waiting for you guys to invite us in but the door has always been open we just didn't know so I appreciate that. And um, I ain't come here to talk about myself. I came here to speak on behalf of the cause and the mission. So I speak on the collective. I work with four other women. Um, you know what I'm saying? Uh, my sister Kay, my sister Shanita, my sister Nia, and my sister Cheyenne. I see sister Kay back there as well. And um, sister Lissa. Um, all of this is really about the collective advancement of our people. And the things that we're doing right now are things that people say, couldn't be done. And things have been hidden from us because I'm learning just now that there are things that have been doing and things that have been going on and we weren't aware of it. So there's been a conspiracy to separate ourselves from our mothers and from our fathers, you know what I'm saying, and from our ancestors. So I'm really, really happy to be invited here to be able to be in the presence of all of this. Um, what I represent is an organization called Finding Empower Through Education. And what that essentially means is All right, finding empowerment through education. That essentially means that the knowledge that we've been given, the hands that we've been dealt, we're gonna take it and we're gonna make lemonade out of it. The lessons that were accurate and inaccurate, we're going back over all of them and restudying them so that we can give our children the truth. Um, we recently started a homeschool for children ages two to nine, and we're looking to expand that to fit children of all ages so that we can really dynamically change the face of this society to make it comfortable for us. Um, on the same token, we're starting various programs for different sectors of, you know what I'm saying, our population. Our children are the most important, however. Our teens, our young people, and our young sisters who are going through this struggle trying to figure it out themselves. You have people who are in this room today that have given me strength and courage that I wouldn't be, capable, wouldn't be capable of being able to be up here to talk to you had it not been for them. So I really appreciate just this continuity of energy and the ability for us to speak on a platform to continue to give it forward. Um, that brings me into what I wanna talk about because being in this generation, I was born in 1985 when this city was on fire. You know what I mean? Everything that we know about freeing Brother Mumia Abu-Jamal has come from this sister, Mother Pam Africa. Yeah. You know what I'm to have the title of the Minister of Confrontation means that you earned some stripes out here. You know what I mean? This is not about playing, this is not about glamour or glitz or anything like that. And all me and my sisters want to do is to continue in that tradition. 
you know? And we wanna learn from you guys so that we can do it the way that will revitalize everybody, you know what I mean? We shouldn't have to take so many L's because we are the queens of this universe. And all I can do is, you know, just sit and bow and all of us just sit at your knees as you can continue to pour this knowledge into us. Um, Mother, Ma Mama Africa, if I'm allowed to call you that. <laughs> you know, um, people speak about, you know what I'm saying, her, her, her ferocious strength, um, her ability to organize on a level to where she wasn't looking for no personal praise. She's in the background, you know, um, at these hearings, you know, up in the face of these police officers, facing confrontation on a daily basis, walking into confrontations which is something that we don't mind doing as sisters, you know what I'm saying? Because you, you have to. How else are you going to dissolve the situation? So when you talk about f courage and fearlessness, the very things that we need to keep this thing going, she is a representative of that. And we are all very thankful. Um, the other thing that I can't, under, um, I can't undermine, though, is the immense sensitivity and the love and the nurturing that all of us hold. And she's definitely, as a mother, as a grandmother, as a great-grandmother, <laughs> passes on that positive energy. And like I said, it's all about the balance between the brothers and the sisters and each person's individual balance amongst themselves. So the more and more we can learn from each other and pour back into each other, that's what we're gonna keep this fight going as, you know what I mean? So um, without further ado, I'm anxious to learn about <laughs> Pam Africa. <laughs> You know, this is a beautiful night. This is what memories is made of. Um, I'm not the only, you know, the MOVE organization. Um, let me tell, give you a quick background on me, all right? And, uh, and I'll go right on in the Harriet. You'll see exactly where she fits in here. Um, prior to 1977, 78, 77, I was a blind, my hair was blind, but I couldn't see it. I was a blind, and all, you know, and I love this government, the red, white, and blue. Every year around Memorial Day, you can see me from head to toe, red, white, and blue. And I did not believe that police brutality existed, and all, only because I was raised in a home. I didn't come up under a conditions where I knew about the Panthers, and all other than the fact that my father told us we had to stay away from them because they killed, they raped, they did this, they did that. Not that he really believed that as well too. My father was a number writer. My father believed in self-employment. He was a number writer. And all he sold and he made corn liquor. And all he ran a gambling house. And he had to pay cops off. And to keep his business going, and, uh, and keep a certain face in the community because a lot of people knew, and he was a giver. He gave to the community as well with what, he, you know, with what we had. Um, he had to have police raids on our, there was police raids on our home. They would pay the cops to send certain cops in to the house. And I always seen those cops get their ass whipped coming into our house. They would court my father off to jail and you know, because of the setup, they were bringing right on back. And uh, you know, that's what I came up under. And I came up, he taught us to fear the Panthers. He taught us to fear Muslims. He taught us to fear a lot of people that was in the movement because he could not have us join the Panthers and be there because that would have been the end of his stuff. People knocking on him. The cops wouldn't been coming the same way. They wouldn't been sending cops in there to get their asses. Well, they've been sending cops in there to whoop ours, you know? It depends upon what part of the party line that you're on. And we just happened to been on the wrong side. It wasn't until 1977 when I met Move and um, Harriet Tubman was known for going in and bringing people out who was aware that they were um, slaves and those who was not aware. I was one of those who was not aware. I thought everything that the master was giving us was good until 1977 when I came across Moose standing on a platform and uh, saying, you know, teaching about 
all the wrongs of this system. And one of the things I remember them saying as well, too, I mean, and they were brandishing guns and stuff, you know. Um, I just couldn't believe what I was seeing. I seen women with babies on the platform, and you know, when I'm saying the platform, Move had built a platform in between themselves and the city because they knew that the city had been coming in, beating, maiming, locking up illegally, killing babies, beating men damn near to death, beating the women damn near to death, all because Move took the position of telling the truth. Jesus Christ was killed because he told the truth. Malcolm was killed because he told the truth. They hunted Harriet because she told the truth. And uh, But here, these people took a stand and said, this is it. You know, you will not come in at night sneaking and you know, or when we're protesting at the um, Puppy Palace. And, uh, and I remember, you know, when Moo was demonstrating the Puppy Palace, what, what, what the hell? You know, they're demonstrating at the zoo, they're demonstrating at Puppy Palace, they're demonstrating the damn reservoir. What the hell? What is people demonstrating the reservoir and demonstrating at the schools? I was one of the ones, I was not fortunate like y'all to know that we were being miseducated. Why would they demonstrate at the schools? May 20th of 1977, all of this information was revealed. Move on one side of the street with guns, the police riding by, and this is the thing that fascinated me the most, was seeing the police ride by in their cars, because I kept looking for them to come out and arrest Move, and all you know, and let me tell you one thing. I was so callous and so insensitive that day. I'm watching this, and I'm looking and wondering what was holding the cops up from arresting them. I was not there in support of MOVE on May 20th, 1977. I came down to the corner to see what was going on, and I couldn't figure out why the cops hadn't come yet. Not that I really wanted them to arrest them, but you know, well, why the hell aren't they there? And, uh, and what it is about these people, they don't mind killing, but the motherfuckers don't want to be killed. And it was clear, the battle was even. Look at Iraq, Iran. The first thing they said is, where are the, you know, when they found out that they didn't have what they thought they had, that's when they came in. You know, wherever it is, that's why I love China. And all uh, you know, they said, come the hell on with it. We got it, and we got the power to use. Oh, that's North Korea. North Korea, I love them. We ain't giving up nothing. And uh, for the first time in my life that I knew, I didn't know too much about the Panthers then, and, uh, um, but you know, I seen these people take a stand against this government, and they started telling me, telling people about the fact that, um, I remember Attica, they started talking about Attica, and I remember seeing it. I'm saying, Move was my Harriet Tubman. And uh, you know, Move came to get me, and, uh, and came to get everybody out there. And long live John Africa, that Move, I had never turned around since then, because for the first time my eyes was open. And I'm gonna tell you what it was open to. And uh, the fact that this movement was for all life without exception, I didn't know, I didn't give a damn. I had fish tanks, I had fish in them. The fish would swim around, I would go away and, you know, forget to feed them, come back, some of them was belly flapping, and all I did was scooped it out and brought some more, tossed it in the toilet. And sensitivity, not loving and understanding life. And what I also found out on that day, and our birds, when they was demonstrating at, um, uh, puppy powers, they had birds in cages. And I'm saying, we spoke, you know, I'm supposed to be at this point sort of sensitive to brothers and sisters in the prison. And uh, you know, while I'm looking at birds in cages, you know, and thinking that, you know, oh, this is cute. Going to the zoo, I'm saying, you know, we're talking about freeing people from Africa, but have you forgot about God's other life that was trapped and slaved and putting them zoos up at 33rd Street or 30th Street and all for some man's entertainment to make a goddamn dollar off and all do you remember when the fire happened and the birds were murdered and killed? I'm saying Harriet came and got me. Harriet came and got me in the form of the move organization to make me understand what mama is and all. Mama all protected all life, protecting of the water. I did 
did not understand why they was demonstrating at the reservoir. I'm saying a lot of people that's drinking water and uh, Fuji, um, this and that, and you know, whatever kind of water it is, you don't understand. You need to throw that shit the hell away and stand up and fight for water that is right. Fight to get the water out the plastic. If you want to drink water out of a bottle, put it in glass. And uh, But I'm saying, the miseducation that we have, I learned something. Harriet came to get me in the form of the MOVE organization. I learned that the elephant and I uh, had no business in a room this size. The elephant home was the jungle, and that's where that elephant was supposed to run on that. I learned that, you know, um, the, um, you know, all forms of life, cats, dogs, and all, uh, the same maker that, you know, when we say, I breathe, you know, I bleed. That's a saying that we have when, you know, attacked by these monsters. And, uh, but the same thing goes for dogs, cats, birds, every form of life until all life is free, ain't none of us going to be free. You can't separate God. But I don't care what you call, you know, that um, the energy, mama, Allah, whatever you want to call it. And, uh, you know, until all forms of life is free, you ain't did nothing. I also want to talk about the Harriet Tubman's that I met on May 20th, 1977. Janet, Janine, Debbie, Merle, and the women who stood up to Ye Sing, and the people who stood up not for themselves, but for each and every last one of us. People say, oh, they're up there after Move because Move refused to comb their hair. Move cursed. Let me tell you one thing. The majority of the people in this room, if you go to a movie, if you go over there, if you don't hear the word motherfucker, if you don't hear some form of a curse word, and people understand, that language isn't mine. I didn't make the word up. It's not Pam's word. It is this government word. Because if I said it to somebody that was in Somali, they wouldn't know what I'm talking about. But for those who know this is uptight because Pam used words of profanity, understand, these motherfuckers drop bombs. Each 
and every last one of us was some educated motherfucker with a pen. Oh, my God. 